Good morning, it is Sunday, November 20th, 2022, and I'm Pastor Mark Dillon of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's begin this morning by opening our Bibles or reading along uh, from the handout in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. It is my opinion that the believer's responsibility to obey this command to live by the Spirit is seldom addressed or seldom exposited or talked about or taught about. Therefore, our understanding of the believer's collaboration with the work of the Spirit is in our experiential sanctification. Sanctification has two parts in regards to salvation. The Spirit of God has set us apart for God's purpose and glory. He set us apart, extracting us from Adam and placing us into the body of Christ. But there's also a second aspect that follows that, which is our sanctification, our being sometimes called holy eyes, are growing in grace in our understanding so that we live lives worthy of our calling. And that's the work of the Spirit, and that's what's being expressed here when it says live by the Spirit. It's not talking about getting saved. These Galatians were already saved. It was now live by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. And so there's a great ignorance, and it has really, I believe, manifested itself through the way in which we live our lives. The ignorance that I encounter day by day talking to people about spiritual things is astounding. And I think there are many <coughs> reasons for this. But for me, it's becoming more and more apparent that the biggest depreciation of this truth comes from not understanding right <coughs> division, not understanding the gospel of the grace of God and what it means in the life of every person that has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I don't believe I'm alone uh, when I say that I have struggled in my own understanding of this since I was saved. Uh, I mean, there's always seems to be some dissonance or some questions and some thinking in my mind like, could I be doing more? Should I be doing more? Could I do better? All of those types of thoughts come into my mind. And so how do I live by the Spirit? Or how do I walk? in the spirit and we're not going to get to that today <laughs> we're going to discuss a couple other things as preparation for that situation but for me it's been almost 50 years of a continual experiential growth and for a long time early on particularly in my uh, pre or post salvation years immediately following I was totally ignorant of how to walk in the Spirit or how to live in the Spirit. But I thank God that through time I have 
But what I would like to say is I cannot dogmatically tell you or instruct anyone how to live by the Spirit. All I can do is share what I believe and then what the scriptures teach. And so your responsibility doesn't depend upon my knowledge. I want to tell you that right now. Your responsibility doesn't depend upon my ability to explain it accurately or perfectly. Your responsibility, and we'll talk about this, you're commanded to live by the Spirit. That's your responsibility. And so how we do that, we probably won't get to today. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm going to use a part of Paul's prayer in Ephesians as my pattern for our prayer to open up our service this morning. And it comes from Ephesians chapter 1. And it begins, I think, around verse 17. And it's on your paper. And it would be my heart's desire that you would pray from your heart, not just because it's on the paper, but you would pray this from your heart also. And so I'm going to read my prayer this morning. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And so, Lord, teach us this day what you would have us know. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. And so, starting in this verse, in verse 16, Paul begins this by saying, So I say. Now, in relationship to what I have just said, that seems to be what Paul's expressing. Most frequently, that in the Bible, it just says something is expressed, and then it says, therefore. And it's going to indicate that now that you've just heard this, here's your response. So now that you've just heard this, here's what you are to do. And so I think uh, by Paul changing and not using the term, therefore, but he says, so I say, I believe he's uh, saying something more explicitly about what he's going to explain now. And so I believe this choice that he makes here to use different words is intentional and is meant to sensitize the reader or is meant to wake up our attention so we don't just slide over it like it's just a normal thing. That he wants us to see this. So I say is indicating the importance of what he is going to follow here. And he says, live by the Spirit. Now the King James Version, and that's why I put both of them up there, walk in the Spirit, they both come from the same Greek phrase. The word live or walk means, and it is a imperative, it is a command. We are commanded by God in his word to walk or to live in the spirit. And like I said, we're not going to talk about that until next week. It means to live or deport oneself, to follow, to be occupied with, and, and we're also going to see it means to be completely filled to be totally fulfilled in the process. And so in the Gospels, that word that's translated walk or live 
is most frequently referring to the physical activity of taking steps. There's only a couple of times when that phrase is used figuratively. But here, Paul is using that term in a figurative sense, and he always uses it. No place in Paul's writings does he talk about the physical activity of walking, as I'm aware of. He always uses it in this spiritual sense, in, uh, in the figurative way. And it has to do with our whole life activity, the whole round of experience in our life is to be lived in the Spirit or by the Spirit. And that term, the world might express it, this is the end game, to be walking in the Spirit. This really isn't taught, maybe somebody here has sat under somebody that really emphasized or has been taught or have studied this out. But in my own experience, it almost seems like it's, I wouldn't call it taboo, but it's just something we don't deal with. Maybe it's because of the over or extended application of taking some of the spiritual activities that occur in the Bible that are not meant to be done today. Uh, there's a great, a great emphasis today by many people on spiritual gifts, such as speaking in tongues and healing and all those things. And you can uh, see on some television shows uh, being slain in the spirit and being overwhelmed with the spirit and all these types of things. And so maybe a little bit of this avoidance of dealing with the spiritual work or the work of the spirit in our lives, we avoid to not get caught into that. But I don't think that's wise to ignore what the scriptures teach just because some people, again, by not rightly dividing the word of truth, extract from other parts of the Bible spiritual activity that is not appropriate or relevant for today. And so we don't have to be afraid to call ourselves uh, that we walk in the Spirit. That's our desire. I believe it's the desire of every believer in Jesus Christ to live a life worthy of their calling. And they're commanded to do so. So how do we do that? Well, we're not going to talk about that today. What we are going to talk about is believers are commanded to be actively, and in this case, that's what it is, to be actively involved in this process. And when that power is manifested in our lives, in our experience, when we are living by the Spirit, this means that we are under the power or the Spirit's control. We are filled with the Spirit, and therefore, there is no room in our lives for the flesh, even though the physical flesh is always with, it, with us. But as the NIV translates the word flesh frequently, it calls it our sinful nature. And so when we are filled with the Spirit, when we are walking in the Spirit, there is no place for the natural man or the sinful nature to manifest itself. Even though sin is always lying at the door, just like it was clear back in Genesis. Sin is always desirous because of our nature to control us. And that's why it's so important that we walk in the Spirit. Let's look at a couple verses. Ephesians 5.18 commands us, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled. And again, it's a present passive verb. To be filled with the Spirit. In Romans 13.14, rather clothed. 
yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's another command, and I think clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, or in the King James Version, it says, put on Christ, I think it is. Well, what that's saying is to walk in the Spirit. And again, we read here, it's in the middle voice, which means we are involved in that activity, and it's done to ourselves. Romans Again, 13, 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think. And here it's a present activity. Moment by moment when your flesh, when your sinful nature brings up sinful thoughts. And you don't have to choose to do that. I've experienced many times standing up here preaching the word with no nothing on my mind but what I'm preaching and all of a sudden through my process of thinking will come some horrific behavior that I've committed in my past. Something else will come in to distract me. And Paul's telling us don't do that. Don't let that happen. You can't stop it but don't let it be your present situation. Don't, how does he say it here? Do not think on it. Don't entertain it any further. When it goes by, don't say, oh yeah, I remember that. I sure enjoyed that. Oops, I wasn't supposed to enjoy that. It was sinful. I mean, that, that's the way our lives are in the natural man. And oftentimes, if we choose to think upon it, we start to relish it. We start to remember it. Don't kid yourself. Sin is pleasant for a season, but when it runs its course, it brings destruction. And so it reminds me of a story, and many of you have probably heard this before. My wife keeps telling me, don't tell those stories over and over again. They've all heard them. <laughs> well, a lot of times, I don't know, you act like you never heard it before. <laughs> but anyway, the story about the woman who lived up on a on like one of these mountains here in Arizona with all the switchbacks, is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. And so she had this road that went up there that was went around the mountain and her carriage driver died. So she was advertising for a new carriage driver. And so different ones came up to interview for the job and she said to the driver, the interviewee, how close could you come to the edge and still control the carriage? And the guy said, oh, I could put both wheels right on the edge of the precipice and I could drive up the whole road that way. And she thanked him and called in the next one and said, how close could you come to the edge of the precipice? And he said, I've got such skill that I could let the rear wheel hang over the edge. <laughs> and I could control it so well that nothing would happen. And she thanked him. And then she called in the third one. And said, how close could you come to the edge? And he said, I don't think I'd come close to the edge. I'd stay as far away as I could. Guess who got the job? Well, that's the way it is with sin. Don't entertain it. When those sinful thoughts come, they come because that's your nature apart from Christ. They come because of the temptation of Satan oftentimes, but it's not necessarily Satan. It's just who we are apart from Christ. It's what we've experienced when we've allowed our sinful nature, our flesh, to run our lives. And so when those thoughts come, don't entertain them. Just turn them off. Don't, you have that ability. You don't have the ability to control the incoming thought once in a while. But over time, they diminish if you don't entertain them. And I'll tell you, and I'll be very frank, as a male, we're a little different than the females, and sexual thoughts oftentimes come into my mind. 
It's not because I've been thinking about it. It's just all of a sudden, boom. And it's been my past experience to entertain those thoughts and to even live them out at times. And so now when they come in, I have a choice. I need to say, I'm not going there. I'm not going to go there. Lord, draw my attention to something else. Get reading a book. Get doing something. Get active and get it out of your mind. Don't go there. Or we can say, ah, just for a little bit. I can get it a little ways, but I won't get caught up in it. And right away, we're opening ourselves up. And so, when those things are going on, that's part of growing in this process to learn and to live by the Spirit. I believe it's also important here, as we're down near the bottom of the page, that we have to make a clarification concerning some terminology. There is a difference, a big difference between living by the Spirit or walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, those types of things, compared with being indwelt by the Spirit. Every believer in Jesus Christ that has trusted the gospel of salvation, that has believed and trusted in the person of Jesus Christ, believing he died for your sins and you're trusting that his blood was the payment that God required to deliver you from your penalty if you believe that the Spirit of God immediately indwells you he takes up residence in your life and that's true for every believer regardless how old they are how knowledgeable they are you don't ask Spirit, come into me. You don't have to ask God to give you a new heart. The Spirit of God comes into you. And instantly, that Spirit starts His ministry in your life. He saves you, seals you, and secures you, guaranteeing your redemption. He will never leave you. He is there for the duration, no matter what you do. He is the seal itself. That will never change. On the other hand, not everyone, not every member of the body of Christ, in fact, I would even go so far as no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly incarnation was ever filled with the Spirit. No human being, I mean, I'm sorry, well, I guess I could say that, continually filled with the Holy Spirit because we are saddled with this flesh. We are in a growing process of this. There are times when we are filled with the Spirit. But I believe the phrase here, filled with the Spirit, is expressing the idea that we are completely under the Spirit's control. Let's look at Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. I'm going to give you a little preview of next week's sermon. This is part of being filled with the Spirit. This is part of living in the Spirit is submission to God. Reckoning yourself that you can't do this. Only God can do this. And so when Paul says, for this reason I kneel before the Father, I believe he's conveying in his very heart he is submitting himself to God. And then in verse 15, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in, the inner, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, May, be, may have power together with all the saints to grasp 
how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In other words, I think what Paul is praying is that this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. That you will grow in all of these aspects until your life is consumed by the Spirit of God. And then it goes on to say, now to him who is able, that's why he bowed before God. Only God can do this. We cannot do this. That's another preview about next week. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be <clears throat> glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. It is in that present moment when we, by faith and the grace of God, are willing to and submissively yielding ourselves in humble obedience to his purpose. And our lives are being divinely controlled that we will be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes the experience is without our awareness. We're not even cognizant that God is using us at this instant. But when God is actually performing his work in us, we are under the control, we are filled with his spirit. And he is controlling our lives. And oftentimes, we have no knowledge of his will or the knowledge of his intent in the matter. But we know, or we should know, that the outcome will be in accord with God's sovereign purpose and counsel of his will. We don't have to be concerned about the outcome. That's got nothing to do with us. We don't have to know the outcome. That has nothing to do with us. That's all according to God's purpose and counsel. Let's look at Ephesians 1.11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, having had our lives laid out, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In the gospel of the grace of God, it brings me great consolation, great peace, great rest to know that it is God that is doing the work. It doesn't depend on me. The only involvement I have is faith to believe that God is doing what he has promised he will do and he's promised he will do it so our role is to be submissively faithful trusting him moment by moment to fulfill his purpose in our lives and so we don't have to look at our lives and say Oh, I'm not able to do that. Or, I should have done this. Anything like that is thinking it depended upon you for God to do his work. It doesn't depend on you. In fact, remember what Christ told when the, the Pharisees confronted him about his disciples? And he said, if they didn't proclaim me, the rocks would cry out. God doesn't need us. He is the I am, the self-sufficient one. He needs nothing from us. But he has granted us the privilege to be used by him to glorify him through his spirit and that spirit's work in our lives. And so as believers, it is our desire to have that accomplished. But we don't have the ability, nor the power, nor even the will apart from the work of the Spirit of God to do it. So again, it comes back to faith. And so, 
2 Corinthians 4, 7 is talking about, I believe, the salvation event and what it has brought to us. But it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Our salvation came to us by the power of God. With it came this treasure of grace, this treasure of God's power for us to live lives worthy of our calling. And we have this power in earthen vessels so that the weapons of our warfare, the power that we have, are, is not fleshly or carnal at all. It is divine power in us. And our role is to submissively desire for God to manifest that in us. And then walk by faith. And so we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit while having no active participation in the process. There is nothing we can do to fill ourselves with the Spirit. That's the Spirit's role. In other words, we do not contribute to nor assist in being filled. Whereas the command for us to live by the Spirit is an active command. We are involved in that process. It is a collaboration between us and our spiritual experience collaborating with the Spirit of God and submissively yielding ourselves to His glory, desires of His will for our lives. And so we are, through faith, actively involved in this process. And then how does that work? Well, I've just put some verses here that when that is going on, when we are living by the Spirit, we will live a life of love. Wouldn't that be nice? One day we're going to live in that existence forever. But right now in our present experience, it's like that little ditty, that little poem. Living with the saints in heaven, won't that be glory? But living with the saints on earth, that's another story. Wouldn't it be wonderful if just in our little fellowship right here, the love of Christ could just be so thick you could cut it with a knife. That we look at every person here without one iota of guile or uh, a sense of unforgiveness or a sense of animosity in any way. And then think multiplying that times millions in the world. Wouldn't that change the world? It wouldn't save anybody, but it sure would make our interactions much better. If we had that love. Well, when we walk in the Spirit, we can experience that love. And when we corporately walk together with that Spirit, we can manifest that love. And then we can experience it. And we can feel it. The reality of the love of Christ in us. And then it goes on to say, live as children of light. Well, living as children of light, we will. We will live as a light to the world. As Jesus Christ said, he is the light of the world. I know he is everything. And he will be manifested in our lives when we walk in the spirit when we live by the spirit it is not they're not seeing mark dilly then they're seeing christ through me and that's why i get no glory they're not seeing anything i'm doing they're seeing the work of the power of god through his spirit in my life and that's why he gets the glory i'm aware of that i take no credit or claim for anything in my life that has any spiritual value whatsoever. It's all by the grace of God and according to his counsel 
and purpose. And then Colossians 2, 6. So just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. In other words, in the same way by which you received him. How did you receive Christ? By grace through faith. How do you allow Christ to live his life in you? By grace through faith. To simply say, Lord, this is all yours. You saved me. You bought me with a price. I'm not my own. I belong to you. It's my heart's desire that you glorify yourself in me. So I give you my life. I present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. I know that. Because you have cleansed me in the spiritual realm from all unrighteousness. Now use me for your glory. And so Paul tells us in Colossians 4 5, be wise in the way you act. And how are you wise? By <coughs> trusting God. By knowing those things. Just yesterday, again, I'm not going to go into the details. But the old flesh once more manifested itself in an effort to be humorous. And I've been embarrassed for 24 hours. Ashamed. But thank God for his grace that it hasn't changed my relationship with him in one iota. Thank God for his grace that it doesn't disqualify me from being an effective minister of his. And when I say minister, I don't mean pastor. I just mean a minister of of God's grace. And so my prayer, how thankful I am, I don't have to say, oh God, please forgive me. I screwed up again, please forgive me. I don't have to say anything like that. I know I've been forgiven. I say, God, thank you for forgiving me. Because once more, I just showed who I am in the flesh. Who I am apart from Christ. How thankful we should be for the privilege that is ours to live by the Spirit or to walk in the Spirit. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your care and provision for us. And we thank you for your Spirit that lives in us, that dwells in us and is desirous and is working in our lives to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And so, Lord, we believe that. Let us trust in it. And, Lord, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, we might live by that Spirit. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.